Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Committee of the Whole meeting uh, for the 29th. Um, as we begin, I would ask everybody to silence your cell phones if you have them. Um, this afternoon, we have uh, 13 items on our agenda, um, including a, a report from the library director. So there are 12 uh, actionable items. Um, I have been asked to pull items six, seven, 9, 10, 11, and 12 for individual discussion. Um, is there a motion on the remaining items? So move. Moved by second. Paul Degula, second by SIPMA. Um, so for those of you in the audience, if you're here about um, one through five or eight, uh, please let me know and we'll pull that. Okay, seeing no one, um, call the roll. Podjagula? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Straight? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Barney? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Motion carried. Um, that brings us to item number six, the accounts receivable finance charges. Is there a motion? Move. Moved by Podjagula. Second. Se seconded by Olson. Discussion? Alderman uh, Wolski. Thank you, President Janser. I just pulled this for a brief comment. Uh, um, and, and to thank uh, Alderman Padragula for, for the sort of dogged work that went into getting this uh, in front of us. It's been about a six month process. Um, Mr. Lakefield, I see you stepped up here. I do have one question. Uh, are uh, the accounts that have been maybe not in his current standing, are, are, have we been able to get in touch with those folks and are they getting caught up as this gets implemented? Finance Director. Alderman Janser and committee members, the the accounts receivable report, the aging report, is substantially better since we just started discussing this. And some of the the uh, accounts in question that originally precipitated this action um, are substantially better shaped than they were before. So we have made a lot of progress. Uh, this has been a little bit of a long project because we don't have a test environment in our accounting software. So we have to actually do this testing in our live system and it calculates it based on aging days. So obviously <coughs> if we go in and, and create a test invoice, it has to go through the aging process before we can see if the calculations are working out correctly. And it looks like we have uh, that set up correctly. We still have a little bit more work to do to assign these finance charges to our charge codes in our system, but uh, we're definitely um, ready to roll this out the way it looks. So I think we're in pretty good position there. Okay, thank you. Alderman Potter, you um, had a question for Dave. Um, when I first brought, and this is a big, this is an important thing to me, and I'm, I'm wanted to thank you and, and the city manager and the others involved in this process of getting this thing going. Uh, I think it once again illustrates the need for better management information systems. Uh, we shouldn't have to be in the position of asking you to do things that your equipment doesn't allow you to do. So I appreciate the efforts you've undertaken. Um, I was primarily concerned about the um, uh, overdue uh, uh, commercial private hauler accounts of the landfill. And I was thinking we would be picking up maybe something like $2,500 from those. Uh, I'm not very good at 
figuring interest and stuff like that. That was just a guess. But in the materials here, you're saying that this charge could potentially generate $12,500 a month for us? Could you uh, clarify that, please? Yeah, Alderman Pondergooler and, and committee members, that would be um, on what's on the aging report um, as of last week when we did this memo, if that was all subject to the finance charges, um, that is what it would potentially uh, raise. Now, there are some items on our aging report that aren't going to be able to be subject to the finance charges. For example, monies that we're waiting for reimbursement from the federal or the state government or other government agencies, some of those types of things. Uh, but that was just merely taking some of the stuff. There are some accounts on there that are currently in litigation. Mm -hmm. So the likelihood of collecting finance charges on those is, is probably not very likely. But uh, again, that was just the potential based on the amount outstanding that is <coughs> past where we would begin assessing the finance charges. So it sounds like we could collect a significant amount of interest on money people owe us? It, it is certainly possible. And uh, just also for some clarification, when we get this up and started, invoices that are currently in the system will not be subject to the finance charges. It'll only be invoices moving forward. And that's just another limitation with how the system is set up. And those invoices, uh, when they were, were entered into the system, were not subject to this finance charge. The only way that we could go back and change that would be to go and write off all those invoices, re-invoice them, and start the aging process over again. Um, and there are some reasons why we wouldn't want to do that, uh, potentially for the ones that are in litigation already. Well, it sounds like a very positive step, and I appreciate your efforts. Mr. Mayor. Um, Dave, for tomorrow's meeting, could you give me the balance for that, uh, <clears throat> the one individual that precipitated all this action? I'd like to know where they're at. Um, if you give me just a couple of no, seconds. No, I'd rather do it offline. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I have it, so. Okay. Any further discussion? Thank you, David. Oh, I'm sorry. Alderman Spray. Uh, thank you, President Janser. I guess, uh, Alderman Padraigul, I, I appreciate your, your questions and uh, statements on it. And I guess uh, just by addressing it now, we're going to address the abuse that's long overdue, I think, here. And I, I think uh, that's the, uh, the real takeaway for me is people know that the city is no longer going to be the bank. And I, I appreciate this, Dave, and I know I'm sure it's been a little bit frustrating, but... Um, it's long overdue, so thank you. Hey, Mr. President, if I may, um, just another clarification. What, going through this whole process, we um, adopted or are designing a form that's an account agreement application, so we have some additional information. Nice. It has some language on there regarding you know, potential discontinuation of city services or uh, <coughs> referring uh, to those accounts to collection after 90 days. Some of that type of language that uh, gives us some other mechanisms to enforce collection as well. Alderman Padre-Gula. I read that agreement and it seemed very nice. It seemed clear, it seemed specific, and I think it spelled out some of the consequences when you don't pay your bills and the taxpayers are left on the hook. So that was, a, for me, a model of the kinds of forms the city should be developing and using. I really appreciate it. it was, I felt it was very good. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? Please call the roll. Padraigula? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Strait? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Barney? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Motion carried. Item number seven uh, is our next item, and it is to amend the CDBG citizen participation plan to change to the city clerk as the citizen participation contact person. Is there a motion? Move approval. Moved by Olson, second. second by Sitma. Discussion? Alderman Wolski. President Janser, thanks. Uh, probably a, a question maybe for Mr. Barry here, but um, it, it sounds like this is being precipitated by a, a larger change in responsibility between uh, the, the public information officer uh, or, or who I would have thought was in a, a role of the public, public information officer to the city clerk. Is that largely correct? <coughs> Uh, Alderman Janser, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Alderman Wolski, yes, we are changing the way that we process public records requests. 
uh, inside the city. This is uh, excluding how we handle them at the police department. They have their own records clerk, essentially, who, who processes quite a bit more public records. So this is just all other records. And essentially, because the city clerk is the, is the controller of all the records for the city, it makes sense for the city clerk to be managing the public records process. Now that's not to say that uh, our city clerk will be alone, as rarely those who manage the public records are alone in, in acquiring the records from various department directors or other uh, department staff or working with our legal team to evaluate whether or not certain records are disclosable and, and those sorts of things. But we want to keep our public information and communications person working on public communication and information, not processing records. We have a clerk for that. It makes more sense to have that function included in the clerk's functions. I've talked with the clerk about this. There is capacity for this work to be done inside the clerk's office and um, additional resources will be freed up then on our communications front to continue the communication efforts we've made as a city so far. President Chancellor. Uh, I continue. Thank you, sir. I, uh, I, I appreciate hearing that, Tom. Uh, as, I, as I read this memo and this proposal, <coughs> um, what, what struck me is the fact that, that we still, uh, we title our, our public information officer as such. And, and so I think there might be a little confusion from the public in terms of, you know, just user design. When they, when they come to us with a request, I think they're going to immediately go to, to Derek for these things. Um, so I, I wonder, you know, just thinking out loud here, if it might be appropriate to, to retitle our uh, public information officer to something like communications director. So uh, because, again, as I look on the outside at, at that particular title, um, I, I think it's going to be confusing for, for the average citizen. They're going to look at Derek as the person to go to first. Mm -hmm. so. Mr. Mayor. I have a, a, a concern uh, only with the, uh, the workload that the city clerk is going to be taking on. Um, it's one of the things that I've really grown to appreciate is the, is the city clerk's office and how much work that they do or she does in this particular case and to add more uh, it gives me great concern, and I think that it's your responsibility, Mr. Barry, to make sure that she does either has the, the help to take the, on these responsibilities um, and help her manage that because she has a full-time job now, and to take this on in addition, uh, I, I think is, uh, I guess, she would be the best judge of that, but I don't want to put her on the spot right now either. But um, it's going to become your responsibility to make sure she does not become overloaded, overburdened, and uh, particularly uh, preparing. I mean, she has an awful, awful lot of work to prepare for our meetings, uh, the council, the minute. It, it, it's an incredible job, and it concerns me that we're adding to that. But um, for the purposes of today, I intend to support it. City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mayor Barney. Just to just to hopefully alleviate any concerns that you might have, I spent significant time with the city clerk discussing this move before we made the recommendation. Uh, we did a workload uh, breakdown, allocation breakdown for the time that she has available in the job. We also sat with the city clerk as well as the public information officer to evaluate what kinds of requests and what the nature of those requests and the times involved in those requests are. And I think all four of us were very comfortable in making the recommendation. So it hasn't been something that's just been brought forward to you without any thought or consideration. But you are correct. We'll manage accordingly to ensure that, uh, that the public gets the records that they need and the time that they need and that staff are also uh, balanced as it relates to workloads. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, call the roll. Olson? Yes. Padragula? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Strait? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Barney? Yes. Jancic? Yes. Motion carried. That brings us to item number nine, the neighbor next door amended lot sale authorization. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Sitma? Second. Second by Olson. Discussion? Alderman Strait. I, I guess, uh, Chairman Janser, I'm, I'm appreciative of staff uh, kind of working through some of the issues that had initially arisen uh, to, to get this taken care of. I, I think it's going to be 
not only some time savings for public works to not have to manage all these properties, but uh, I know there have been neighbors that have expressed interest in it and it's just trying to overcome some of those hurdles. So I'm appreciative of uh, moving this forward. Okay, thank you. President Jansen. Alderman Sitma. If uh, Mr. Zakian is available. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I know you've uh, been exploring this probably to the better extent than uh, most of us have been. Do you have any kind of idea in terms of numbers, uh, just even from the get-go, lot sale-wise, uh, through the program, how many we might be able to get out the door in a hurry? Sure. Um, you can tell from my voice that the pollen count must be through the roof. <laughs> It probably will be this way for the record until probably July. Um, we've had um, 14 individual inquiries, uh, and that has covered um, either nine or 10 of the lots. We've had additional inquiries on some of the other lots after the fact. Um, so it would not surprise me if uh, more of the lots will actually go for sale okay. in the auction. Thank you, sir. I, I was pleased to see in the write-up that the the folks who have made an inquiry will be notified by mail or, or some manner like that so that they're aware of the bidding process and will be able to jump into that. Uh, President Jancer, almost thanks to all of you, actually, who have been um, very supportive of me in terms of your inquiries. And I want to give you all credit for just forwarding them to me. And, that's fine. Um, every one of them will be immediately notified um, on Tuesday, assuming this is approved on Monday. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Alderman Sitma. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, President Janter, and I just wanted to uh, lastly convey the, the more so of getting a lot of these lots off the city's books for continual maintenance. <coughs> We've seen over the last couple of summers that, that that's a taxing issue. Money, money and taxes, tax-wise, but it'll be good to get a lot of those back in private hands, back in the tax roll, but some of the load off of the city employees for continual maintenance, sidewalk removal, or snow removal, and, and weed cutting. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote. Call the roll. Sitma? Yes. Street? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Barney? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Padragula? Yes. Motion carried. Uh, item number 10 is the spot blight acquisition policies and procedures. So moved. Moved by Sipma. Second. Seconded by Padregula. Discussion. Alderman Padregula. Just wanted to comment uh, and verify. We're looking at uh, finding essentially or reallocating $800,000 to uh, deal with blighted properties. Um, in addition to having people pay their fair share, this is another very important issue for me. And uh, I just wanted to uh, thank you, Mr. Zakian, for and the, the other staff for, uh, I don't say wheeling and dealing, but for uh, finding maximal flexibility in the federal uh, grants we've signed up for. Uh, I see this as a major accomplishment. Uh, if, if memory serves me right, most of these homes are probably in the thirty, forty thousand dollar range in terms of their current assessment, their current value. So eight hundred thousand should allow us to buy out maybe twenty homes. And that, by my rough estimate, would be maybe a half to a third of all the homes out there like that. I know there are other programs that are being utilized, but uh, this to me is a really big deal in trying to finish repairing the, the our community from the ravages of the flood. So I really, really, really uh, appreciate what's what's happened. Alderman Sitma. Thank you. Thank you, John, uh, for coming back to the podium. I did have a couple of questions on here, and maybe we can get them answered in, in one uh, one quick spot here. Uh, with some of the homes um, being obviously in, uh, some of them might be in the floodway, some of those that uh, are, are not, if the city does acquire them, does the city then, because of this funding mechanism, have the ability to resale kind of in that same neighborhood uh, process? or? Do these dollars that we're acquiring them have any restrictions on what could happen with those properties? Um, Alderman Sitma, President Janser, uh, it's HUD. So unfortunately, my answer, I will try to be as brief as I can, but it's not simple. 
Um, all of the properties that we are acquiring um, have to have had damage from the flood. Um, we have identified um, roughly 35 to 36 that appear um, to qualify under those conditions. Um, it'll be subject to further inspection by city inspection services and review by the city assessor, but that appears to be the population base we're dealing with. Um, since we are using a, dish, a new national objective that we haven't previously used, spot blight is an eligible national objective all on its own. Um, we are required, once we acquire these properties, because they are in substandard condition, to demolish them. And that's why we've also added additional funds um, to the demolition line under allocation one. In a next, now, that was what was, is being done on this. Now, what then HUD allows is that once we acquire these properties and once we demolish them, I can then come back to the city council and offer several options and ideas as to how we move forward with these properties. Um, and once a decision is made, it is a technical amendment, not a substantial amendment. And that would means that other than posting it for five business days, we can then proceed to decide how we want to address future use. But they are two separate actions. As far as HUD is concerned right now, all they want to see is action to try to acquire these properties and demolition, demolish them because they are, our argument, which I think is very legit, and I've heard it from all of you, is that the condition of these properties are threatening the stability of the neighborhoods they are in. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Janser. Uh, Mr. Zakian, in the uh, the description, um, I'll just kind of go down. The option of either agreeing to our offer price or within 30 days of receipt of the initial letter provide proof of the intent to repair the home to bring into code compliance. What What is a timeline um, that is acceptable within code compliance? I, I'm, I'm curious from the standpoint of you had sent us an email two months ago about driving by a property on East Burdick Expressway, and it, uh, we're seven years almost in, and the, the homeowner has now sunk some money into the property. Um, I've heard two years ago when I first was elected to city council, I got a phone call from someone over by Mr. Sitma's. Um, they wanted this house gone, and I just ironically ran into this gentleman in the grocery store the other day, and he said, Shannon, too late. They're coming in, and they're, they're finally going to try to make some repairs. So I'm wondering what is the city's acceptable timeline if they decide to, you know, fill out a, permit, a building permit and then rebuild one of these properties? The um, Alderman Strait, President Janser, um, it is, I know it's a huge document, but in the document there is a timeline spelled out, so this is a good question. Um, from the date they received the letter, until when they'd have to have the house in code compliance. We're not, we're not going to go beyond what is basically required. The two standards that have to meet is code compliant and ability for the city to determine and allow its occupancy, which is what HUD is looking for. Um, the total amount of time allowed is 150 days, and there are specific benchmarks. By the way, that house that I witnessed, it, it took 120 days, but it is now, at least from what I can see, um, I've had a chance to check our records, but it is fully rehabbed. And again, the goal of this program is, is this is not unusual in this kind of program to give them either or option, because the goal of this problem is to remove conditions threatening neighborhoods. So if a homeowner legitimately wants to come forward um, based on a wake-up call, as several have, as we've seen evidence, fine. And then we've accomplished our goal. Um, okay, Alderman Strait. Yeah, continue. thank you, Chairman Janser. I guess, John, I, I appreciate hearing that because I think as we've all discussed this, we want people to rebuild. Mm -hmm. We want the tax base. Clearly, 35 of these, 36 of them might be too far gone. But anybody who might be willing to sink the money in, I, I you know, building the infill, as we've discussed, and I heard Alderman Sitma say the other day, is clearly something that we're trying to do. So. I appreciate kind of hearing the process and knowing that city staff are willing to kind of help work with people. And I also recognize on the other side of it that people want these places gone. They're tired of it. They're frustrated. It's been an emotional kind of 
turmoil. So uh, I just wanted that said. So thank you, John, for your work. Other questions for Mr. Zakian? All right, seeing none, thank you, John. All right, any further discussion about the motion? Seeing none, I assume you're ready to vote. Call the roll, please. Sitma? Yes. Street? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Barney? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Hodgewuller? Yes. Motion carried. Item number 11 uh, is uh, regarding establishing a Renaissance Zone administrative application fee to help cover costs. Um, this is an item that had been um, before us, um, gone up to the previous city council meeting and then is now uh, back for uh, further uh, clarification and discussion. Um, so is there a motion to start off with, I guess? Alderman Wolski. President Chancellor, thanks. I, I would move that we uh, adopt a Renaissance Zone uh, administration and application fee um, in the amounts of $350 for a commercial project and $150 for a residential project. Okay, is there a second to that? Second for discussion. Seconded by SIPMA. Discussion. Alderman Wolski. President Janser, thank you. Uh, this is uh, this is against the, the the recommendation that staff has offered. I, I think it simply just comes down to a matter of a, an opinion on on what's appropriate in this situation. My opinion is is that I would prefer to see a fixed fee on this. Um, one, I I don't like the idea of basing uh, the fee based on the amount of improvements that are in the application uh, because I think that that's going to incentivize lowering the, the dollar value that is actually written down on that particular application. Uh, now that in some senses may work against their application because it, it's all tied to uh, the value of the property pre-existing and the amount of dollars that are invested into the property, whether they, they qualify for the program or not. But um, it also becomes something that becomes a subject of do, do we attempt to verify that? Do we attempt to try and, uh, you know, confirm that that is the amount that has been improved. It, I, I'm just not sure I like the idea of tying the fee to that. Um, I think regardless of the situation, you know, it's very appropriate to, to put a fee in place. Um, but e even at the percentage based, you know, we're, we're still likely going to be, we're not going to recover all we have invested in this. Um, and so my goal in, in crafting these numbers, and, and I'll, I'll be very frank, they're somewhat arbitrary, uh, is to, to create numbers that were uh, high enough that, that people aren't going to simply be submitting applications uh, to, to, to use our time, but also low enough that they don't uh, disincentivize use of the program. Because ultimately, these are, these are incentive programs, these are tools that we're attempting to use to induce the, the redevelopment of these properties. and. Uh, uh, I, I want to make that process as simple as possible. Further discussion? Alderman Strait. Uh, thank you, Chairman Janser. I guess as I've had uh, the month to think about it uh, and read staff comments, I, I'm also aware that uh, this is to incentivize, you know, the re restoration and renew of a particular area. Folks are obviously going to receive uh, the benefit in the short term of property tax uh, relief, if you will, for a period of up to five years. Um, but on the other end of it, by renewing and restoring these areas, they're also going to start paying additional, probably much higher property taxes, which we are hopefully going to then recoup some of that to go to offset what might be some of these fees. So that's what, how I've logically been trying to uh, look at this. Uh, I appreciate Walderman or Alderman Walski's uh, comments. And uh, at the beginning, I I wasn't against the fee, but I, uh, I appreciated uh, Mr. Zakian's kind of detailed analysis of trying to come up with a fee based on staff time. And um, so uh, I I could agree to a fee if uh, others here uh, think that the three hundred and fifty dollars that Alderman Walski proposes is is fair and justified, or if uh, folks go with city staff, I, I can understand that and support that as well. Alderman Janser. Alderman Olson. 
I would like to amend Alderman Walski's motion and make it a flat fee of $500, no matter what the project is. Is there a second? I'll second it for discussion. Okay, the uh, motion is to amend uh, the uh, amount to a flat fee of uh, $500, regardless of the project, uh, Alderman Olson. And I think that that's just taking into account the number of hours that staff put in. Um, typically when a project is larger, a lot of the research and, and um, background work has been done. It's probably the smaller projects that take a little bit more time and city staff. So I think that this just kind of levels the playing field a bit. Further discussion? Alderman Sipma. Uh, not sure if this one would go towards the uh, city manager or maybe staff on this. When it comes to the Renaissance Zone, most often we are talking about commercial mixed use. There are some residential properties, obviously, within that. Um, if we were looking at a, a separated fee structure for the residential and, and, and commercial, how does the mixed use come into play on that? Is it uh, based off of the <coughs> R1 or is it based off of its use in that sense? Well, Mr. Chairman, Alderman uh, Sitma, we would, we would need to evaluate how exactly to look at that. Uh, for mixed-use facilities, depending upon what type of project is being conceived, for example, sometimes there will be the commercial aspect of the project that will be done and the, and the residential won't be, or vice versa. If both were being done, we'd look at percentage based upon what the dominant percentage is. For example, if it's a residential, largely a residential rehab, for example, uh, we would probably do that. I think Alderman Olson's recommendation of a flat fee of $500 gets away from any con uh, confusion associated with is it residential or is it commercial or is it mixed use? That does have a benefit. Uh, and keep in mind, uh, to Alderman Olson's uh, point, there is a certain amount of time, regardless of whether the project is commercial or residential or, or whatnot, that staff have to put into evaluation of the application as well. So hopefully that provides a little bit more information. Alderman Wolski. President Janser, thanks. And I, I appreciate Alderman Sitma uh, bringing that forward, that question forward and, and Mr. Berry's response. Um, my intent in the motion was uh, to, to clarify a little bit, would have been to, to capture those properties that are single family homes and, and, and you know, strictly uh, single unit residences into that residential side of things. Uh, you know, obviously, I think one of the goals inside of the Renaissance Zone overall is to the development of mixed-use properties, uh, and and you know, uh, diversity in both housing and commercial space and things like that. And so, the it, you know, just for the clarity of, of of why I offered that particular motion in the way I did, it, that was the differentiation that I was looking at. Um, I fully expected that those definitions and how we interpreted that was going to be something we were going to have to wrestle with during this discussion. So. Okay. Further discussion on the amendment? Question. See, I'm sorry. Question for the here. city manager or whoever um, would be most knowledgeable about the Renaissance Zone things. Um, what kind of dollar amounts are we talking about for a typical uh, Renaissance Zone application. I, it, I know there's a wide variability, a wide variance. Um, do we have any idea what the average modal median <laughs> request is? City Manager. Thank you, Chairman Janser. Um, Alderman Padre Guler, are you referring to the, the, the construction size or are you referring to the application fee? Because currently there is no application. I know that, yeah. It, it, Steve, Steve, it seems to me like there was something in the write-up that the average was um, somewhere over a hundred thousand dollars. I mean, you know, it, it's uh, um, it, uh, they're fairly decent sized, if I remember right. Maybe Mr. Zakian knows that number. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah, in the write-up it indicates that uh, between a hundred thousand and one hundred twenty-five thousand is the um, range. And that, um, President Janser and Alderman Padraigal, that covers, uh, it varies, but that is pretty standard as the mean, and that covers um, 70, going back to the beginning, that covers 70 approved projects. Okay. 
I guess I'm wondering if there would be many single family homes or predominantly residential uh, applications or have there been, do we know? President Chancellor Alderman Podjagula, um, as it's currently constituted, um, I'm doing this a little ballpark, um, between 85 and 90 percent of the sense. blocks identified with the potential for getting benefits are not single family, are not single family. Okay. Um, over the life, I would say, of the, of the application history that I've seen, uh, the predominant has been either mixed use or commercial, um, ranging from full buildings. Um, there's been one multi, significantly sized multifamily building, a tenant building, um, apartment building, but very few single family. But it is an eligible use applicant. Okay. Any further questions? Okay, we are back on discussion of the amendment by Alderman Olson to adopt the flat uh, fee rate of $500 per application. Further discussion? Alderman Wolski. I, I, uh, I'll share just some thoughts on the specific <coughs> amendment. I, I appreciate Alderman Olson uh, bringing forward a an alternative for further discussion, particularly in that it's even simpler than, than the motion I initially offered. I think that's an improvement. Um, I'm gonna vote against it just because I, I frankly believe the $500 fee is a little more than I want attached to this particular program. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote. Call the roll. Olson? Yes. Padragula? No. Sitma? Yes. Straight? No. Wolski? No. Barney? No. Janser? Yes. Four to three. Okay, so the amendment is defeated, and we're back on discussion of the original motion, which had the fees at 150 and 350. Is there further discussion of the motion? Mr. Oh, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mayor. I, I just wanted to comment that I think that the uh, the 350 is too low for a commercial property. <clears throat> I voted against the amendment because I thought 500 was too high for a chair. residential area. Um, but um, I, I think that the 350 is, is, is too low on some of these larger projects and uh, would make an amendment at 500 for commercial and leaving 100 for uh, residential. 150. 150, sorry. Okay, is there a second? Second. Second by Padre Gula. Discussion of the amendment. City Manager, do you have a comment? Uh, I had a comment and a, and a question, actually. The, the comment I would just make uh, to the City Council is that we do want to make sure that you are aware, it was, was posted in the memo, that the cost estimate that we believe associated with processing these is between 600 and 900. So anything less than that is going to be a subsidy by uh, our offices essentially to process these things. Given the fact that there's considerable tax benefits for these types of projects, we don't feel that six to nine hundred dollars is an impediment to realize <coughs> those incredible tax benefits over the five year period that is potentially eligible for these projects. Uh, and then maybe to my question is to uh, the single family or residential fee versus the commercial. We're, we're gonna have some confusion unless we get very specific direction from the city council on uh, what we mean by single family. Are you talking about a, a home? Or are we talking about, you know, or are we talking residential, which would include then multifamily units? Uh, we do have a lot of those, apartment complexes and those types of things in town that we just need to be clear on exactly what we mean and what happens when we get a mixed use facility, which was discussed earlier. Mr. Mayor. I think that if we can't distinguish that, then we have bigger problems than what we're discussing today. I think that uh, we can certainly just go by the zoning. If it's R1, we know that it's a residential single family home. And I don't think it needs to be any more complicated than that. If it's something other than R1, if it's a multifamily home, it's not a single family home. If it's mixed use, it's not a single family home. Uh, I think it's very clear. And I don't think we need to go much further beyond that. Further discussion on the amendment? Alderman Padrigula? Maybe this will, should be saved for the, the main motion finally when we figure out what it will be. Okay. Um, understood. 
Okay, so we're going to vote on the amendment, uh, which is to have $500 per application fee for uh, commercial or uh, non-single family and $150 for a single family uh, uh, renaissance project. Call the roll. Barney? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Hodrigula? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Straight? No. Wolski? Yes. Okay. Motion carried. Um, so now we're back to the main motion uh, as amended uh, with the um, <coughs> fees of uh, $150 for a single family project and um, essentially $500 for uh, others. Alderman Potagula, did you have a comment? Yes, I wanted to justify my vote in favor of this because uh, I'm mindful of what Mr. Berry has told us about this not really approaching the cost of what it takes the city to do this and there being significant financial benefits over the long run to a property owner. Um, I've argued for fiscal responsibility for a long time and I want to explain why in this case I'm going to argue against it or vote against it. Um, I've really been struck as I've been going around town um, um, systematically uh, about the very wide range and the quality of the housing stock. Um, I've been impressed by some extraordinarily beautiful and expensive homes in certain parts of town I didn't even know existed. I've also been impressed by the, I'm not quite sure what tactful word to use to describe um, some of the housing stock we have, particularly near downtown, that very much could benefit from a renaissance. Um, and I think we need to do everything we can to make it easier for people. Uh, commercial businesses I'm not quite as concerned about, but certainly for single family homes. If we can get you know, a few of these improved, I think it would make a material difference in our community and the quality of life, frankly, for a significant number of people. Um, I, this is one of those few things where I'm willing to make an exception and not have something pay for itself, because I think the greater good of improving the community, of um, improving the housing stock is more important. And I just wanted to explain that because I want to be consistent in, in terms of my vote and, and what I say and what I think. Um, okay, thank you. Alderman Sitma. Thank you, Mr. President. And not to uh, throw some fuel on uh, maybe a, a little, little ember to uh, reignite the fire here on the classification. Um, to, to Mayor Barney's point on this, I, um, I almost feel that we need a little more clarification on what co constitutes uh, a residential property, and Mr. Zakian might be able to uh, uh, provide a little bit of light on that, only because if somebody's coming into rehab, just a simple duplex that is in R1. I have a few of those that were grandfathered in. Not to, I don't live in the Renaissance zone, but there could be some confusion very easily adopted into this otherwise. Mr. Zakian, can you shed some light? Sure. Uh, President Chancellor Alderman Sitma, um, on this particular item, we're off the hook. Um, the Renaissance Zone very clearly defines and distinguishes between a single family and anything else. And a single family is, as Mayor Borney had pointed out, it's a single family. It can be a townhouse, it can be a condo, but it's a freestanding single family home to be occupied by one family. And that is expressly defined in the uh, Century Code. <laughs> Thank you very much. Alderman Strait. Thank you, Chairman Janser. So, John, um, to Alderman Sitma's point, uh, would you allow R1 G grandfathered in to this program? And could, could you enlighten me? About yeah, and R the reason I bring it up, uh, I emailed Mr. Meyer earlier in the week about uh, a property that I'm renovating right now, and it has nothing to do with the Renaissance Zone, but I found out and was enlightened that it is R1G and was grandfathered in, and this body will have to review in uh, two years' time uh, a decision that was made 20 years ago to look at um, properties that were given a little bit of leniency to turn into multifamily structures. Mm -hmm. And so I currently own a, a duplex that when I started renovating it, it was a fourplex. 
and the neighborhood wants me to turn it into a residential family structure, which I would love to do, um, but that's why I'm asking the question. Um, thank you. Um, President Chancellor will demonstrate. Um, the Century Code does not distinguish local city codes. It simply defines what I just said to you. So it would be, if the applicant comes in, whatever the prior use might have been, if the applicant can come in to rehab and make into a single family home, as long as the applicant can show us that they have taken the steps necessary to comply with city code, yes, we will treat that as a single family home. Gotcha. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zakian. Alderman Olson. I, I'm getting into the weeds just a little bit, but as many of us have been going through candidate forums and, and being questioned by citizens, the top topic that comes up all of the time is property tax. And the, the complaint and the concern has been the amount of property tax increase that our citizens saw last year, and they want to know what's going to happen this year. This isn't going to substantially affect property tax, but it could a little bit. If we aren't charging enough fees to cover the costs for our city employees, somewhere, somehow, things need to be paid for. So it's not the hill I'm going to die on, but I think it's a point that needs to be made that when we have opportunities to somehow pay for projects in other ways than through taxes, we need to consider that. Okay. Further discussion? Seeing none, call the roll, please. Wolski? Yes. Barney? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Padragula? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Straight? No. Okay, motion carried. Item number 12, uh, airport activities, reports, projects, uh, updates. Good afternoon, airport director. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Um, please proceed with anything you'd like to enlighten us on. I guess. Do you have? A, do you want to? Uh, uh, well, would you like to? Would you well, like to see or, the presentation uh, today, or did you have a specific question? Or if somebody has questions, I'm not sure who pulled this. Actually, I, I, President Jamster, I pulled this, of course. Of course. Uh, <laughs> of course. Simply to, uh, <laughs> to to share uh, the good news uh, about you know, it looks like a lot of those numbers are finally ticking up. We're we're above. 2017 numbers. We're above 2016 numbers. So I, you know, that's encouraging. I just wanted to say, you know, kind of share that publicly that it looks like there's increased activity at the airport. Uh, Mr. President, Alderman Walski, uh, yes, in the in the numbers that we provide, all of them are up, and uh, some of them are at uh, three-year highs uh, for enplanements and um, uh, revenue. Uh, so that's that's great news. We like to see that going in that direction. Uh, three months is not necessarily a trend to make, but uh, we'll we'll take it and hopefully keep building on it. Mr. Sitma. Thank you. Uh, just in regards to the rental car uh, mm -hmm. itself, simply because that was kind of a point of focus at one, uh, on a few specific time frames, uh, what, what's kind of the general feeling? I, I see our numbers here, and they, they are increasing. What's their comfort level right now? Um, Mr. President, uh, Alderman Sitma, the, the car rental business is doing well. Um, they're renting more cars, uh, and uh, I think that's a reflection of uh, more business-type folks coming into town and, and, um, and, and renting those cars. I will caution you, uh, since we're close to budget time, that the car rental revenue story uh, overall is not going to be a good one, because if you will recall, um, last year we had to renegotiate uh, the uh, at the end of the five-year contract with all the car rental companies that was originally negotiated in uh, 2012 um, at the height of things and the minimum annual guarantee that the car rental companies were paying uh, were quite high uh, they were not anywhere near um, the numbers that helped them make any money here well uh, so in re you know redoing those contracts in 2016 or 2017 um, we're now at a more realistic level. So while they are renting more cars uh, and doing better, the airport is not collecting uh, that minimum annual guarantee that they were before. So that will be a revenue challenge that we have. You know, we have it going on this year, and it will extend into next year as well. Okay. All right. 
Any further questions for the airport director? I see none, Rick. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that brings us to item 13, which is uh, a report from Library Director Janet Anderson. Welcome. Thank you. That was Rick, hold on. <laughs> President Janser, Mayor Barney, and members of council, let me get this ready. Derek told me how to do it. Thank you for allowing me to take some time to talk about the Minot Public Library and share with you some of the library's recent accomplishments. I usually start these presentations by asking members present to raise their hand if they have a library card, but I won't do that. <laughs> but those of you who don't, you know who you are. You don't have to. Each of you has a copy of the library's 2017 annual report in front of you, and I won't waste too much time delving into the details, but please feel free to ask me questions about anything in the report or any of the information I have to share. Before I get into too many specifics, I wanted to share some information from the American Library Association's Libraries Transform campaign. The intention of this campaign is to demonstrate that libraries are necessary to the continued success of our communities. One of the promotional tools used by the Libraries Transform campaign is the because statements, which illustrate that libraries transform because access equals opportunity, because fake news can have real world consequences, or because learning starts before kindergarten. The Minot Public Library has joined in the campaign and is sharing these because statements and creating our own. In 2018, we put up sheets of paper and asked patrons to write on them, telling us why libraries rock. So to date, we have received more than 300 responses from people sharing what they love about the Minot Public Library. As Rick kind of mentioned, a city department head such as myself begin working or finish up working on the 2019 budgets, I thought it would be best to start with the numbers. So as you can see, last year in 2017, the Minot Public Library provided over $7 million in services using the $1.6 million budget. For this year, 2018, the library received 1.07% of the total budget for the city of Minot and will again likely provide more than $7 million in services. When you look at this in another way, you can see that the library provides $147.47 of services for every person in Minot based on the 2016 census. Or you can see that for every $1 we spent, we provided $4.42 in services. Now, when I'm talking about services, there's a variety of things I want you to know we include as services. Reference and research questions, story times, gaming. We have craft and art classes for all ages, DVDs, CDs, homebound delivery for patrons who can't make it, and of course, books. So I don't expect you to read all of this, but I want you to know that I'm, I'm not just making these numbers up. This is the ROI calculator that I use to calculate the information. It's been thoroughly vetted, and I'm happy to share this information with council. But essentially, it's telling you what people would pay for the services the library provides if they were to go to a business. But better than number are photos and stories. So here I'm proud to show you some photos just from this year. We have teen gaming up on the top left. We have a busy board for toddlers and babies that our maintenance director made. Our Dr. Seuss Day, which annually gets more than 300 attendees. And then in the bottom, we had a lot of great programs for adults, including visits from family members of Crazy Horse. And in the middle there, you can see where we had the deck building. Also, we were at a Magicon this year. On the top left, you'll see a young man who got his photo taken using our green screen technology. Next to that was our Women Lead program, which encouraged women to run for public office and become more involved. The young man at the far right is trying to test if his egg is going to break when he drops it. And then we have in the bottom corner almost 1,000 pounds of donated items that we gave in our first ever Food for Fines. So 
What else do we have going on? Well, despite what many people may think, libraries are not just stuffy repositories of books. The Minot Public Library is continually looking to add services that will help the community. Already in 2018, we have added two very excited, exciting services, which are 3D printing and our tool library. We're also heading into one of our busiest times of year, the busiest times for all public libraries, and that's summer reading. The annual summer reading theme this year is Libraries Rock, and the program will kick off this coming Monday at 2 p.m. at the auditorium. Throughout the summer, the library will have 109 programs for all ages, that's babies on up through adults, and will offer opportunities for people, again, including adults, to win prizes for reading. So despite our successes, the Minot Public Library still faces a variety of challenges. As I mentioned earlier, the 2019 budget is looming at the forefront of everyone's mind, and I'm no different. I could tell you that we've had a tough time filling professional positions. I could share that despite the best forecasting, mechanical equipment breaks down. I could tell you that we have carpeting that hasn't been replaced for 20 years. And I could remind you that the building itself is 52 years old, but I won't do that. Instead, I want to share what is the most frustrating challenge I face on a daily basis, and that's the belief that libraries are no longer relevant, possibly the same belief held by people in this room and certainly by people in our community. The following are actual quotes I've heard from people in Minot. I hear similar things like this at least weekly, sometimes from close friends and family members, sometimes from leaders in our community, sometimes from the occasional barista or nurse who I run into. So I could ask you a lot. I could ask for carpeting or exterior renovations or new shelving or a lobby remodel. And someday I probably will. But today I simply ask you to help me overcome this challenge by being an advocate for the Minot Public Library, for this tremendous city service. If you don't have one already, please get yourself a library card. Tell others about what I shared today and let your friends and family know about the services available at the library. Also, remind your constituents that these services are intended for them. Thank you. Alderman Strait. Uh, thank you, Chairman Janser. Uh, Janet, how much does it cost to rent a meeting room, out of curiosity? President Janser and Alderman Strait, it varies for nonprofit organizations. There is no charge. Also for city entities, we don't usually charge. The smaller room, I believe, is $25 an hour, and our larger room is $40 an hour. Continue. One follow-up, Chairman Janser. Janet, in, in our world, we're constantly hounded by people to talk about efficiencies. And I, I'm not going to uh, ask you about it, but I'm going to kind of raise it in a, a question. I, I'm curious to know about your collaboration with our Ward County Library, and you don't have to give us all the details, but I'll tell you that a, a conversation I've had with a county commissioner um, who's emailed me has uh, wanted to have a conversation of, is there a way to discuss uh, consolidating our collaboration within our library system? And so I'm a huge supporter of our library. I love it. I have a library card. Um, I'm going to share the meeting room uh, information with folks because that is something that we get asked quite a bit of where can I have a meeting, mm -hmm. um, whether it's just neighborhood residents that want to have a meeting that don't want to go to a coffee shop. So um, I appreciated you bringing that to our, my attention again today. So thanks. Keep up the good work. But uh, stew on that like we all stew on efficiency questions because uh, I think folks would love to hear uh, how we're thinking outside the box, which you uh, do quite a bit in your job. So thank you. Mayor Barney. I just wanted to uh, you know, publicly thank uh, Janet for kind of bringing our, our library into, a, I, I think, a more modern age and making it more user friendly and actually reaching out to the community. I thought the, the tools uh, uh, lending was 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 brilliant. Um, the thing you did with the uh, the building blocks in the community was was inspired. Um, I think that uh, in order to be relevant, uh, a library's got to do more than just uh, have books. And I think you've really done that. And uh, it's not often we get the opportunity to uh, uh, heap praise on the library because it's 
is kind of over there. I never thought of it as a jail, but uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I just wanted to take this opportunity to uh, thank you because it is noticed. It is noticed, at least to me, who, who's been here for a long time and, and, and remember the old library and seeing the changes that have been made and um, bringing it into the, into the current century. So thank you for that. Thank you. President Wolski, do you have a comment? Yeah, uh, just a couple comments here. Um, one, Janet, I uh, greatly appreciate everything you guys uh, do. Um, I, I've learned quite a bit about your operation over the last year through an, a number of different conversations. Uh, obviously, the, the, the addition to the 3D printer was a, a neat success story for the library this year. I think that stuff's really great. Um, I, I want to kind of point out for the larger community that, that the library is a wonderful service. It's a, it's a great return on investment for the dollars we make, but it is also a, an operation or a part of the city's operation that, that we do uh, fund out of a property tax levy. I think we're you know against the revenue that the library generates and their $1.5 million budget. Uh, I think our property tax levy, and correct me if I'm wrong, is the, maybe the $1.2 million or somewhere in that range. Um, I love the fact that we do it. I'm going to continue to support it. I just wanted to point out that, that this is a service that we extend to our, uh, our rural neighbors as well. We do not require people be a City of Minot resident to enjoy the services of the library. Um, I very often uh, kind of catch flack or I catch comments how, how the folks who live on the outside of town or on our outskirts, they have to pay our sales tax and, and there's griping about that. Um, there's also a tremendous amount of value that, that we as a city of Minot return to those individuals, and, and this is one example of those things. Uh, and so I, I just wanted to, to call that out. Uh, I also wanted to call attention to this presentation. I, I greatly appreciate you coming and standing before us, telling us what your department is delivering. Uh, I think there may be a bit of a model here for, for all our departments within the city uh, on a on a, you know, I don't know if it's once a year or twice a year or as often as we need it to be, but to actually start uh, telling our story very publicly. So thank you for that. Thank you. Alderman Olson. I have the great privilege of serving on the Minot Public Library Board of Trustees um, and have transitioned with Janet from one director to a new director. And I do just want to publicly thank you too for, for leading the library team very professionally. Um, she, she does a wonderful job as, as do her staff. So thank you. Thanks. Okay. Very good. I see no more questions. Um, Janet, thank you for uh, reporting uh, about the library to us. and. Uh, giving us some uh, inspiration to uh, support it, and uh, we look forward to good things ahead. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, we have concluded our agenda, and therefore we're adjourned.